My name is Carol Song from Purdue University. It is my distinct privilege to introduce our next speaker for the plenary talk. We're going to have Mike Zender to um, talk about Science Gateway. So Mike has been working in the Science Gateways area for a long time. Uh, first at Purdue University in the same organization that I'm working at. And he's the, um, then he moved down to San Diego Supercomputing Center. Um, we were sad to see him leave, but it's great that he's leading the Sustainable Scientific Software Division at SDSC now. Uh, Mike is also a co-PI on a, a very well-known Science Gateway Nano Hub, and he's the PI for the Science Gateway Community Institute, and uh, most recently the PI for the SGX3 Center of Excellence for Science Gateways, both funded by NSF. Mike also has rich experience and knowledge in entrepreneurship prior to working at Purdue and uh, working at, uh, in academia. He has been a founder and or senior member uh, of uh, uh, several tech startups uh, involving a variety of uh, businesses, um, including supply chain optimization, collaboration, data analytics, and uh, not too long ago, speech training for children with autism. So today he's going to talk about his perspectives on how science gateways may help convergent science um, go, as we go in the future. Please welcome Mike Zentner. Well, thank you, Carol, and thank you for the invitation to speak, Xiao Wen. Um, hopefully people will find this interesting. I'm not a geospatial expert, so uh, please don't judge me on any facts that might be incorrect in that respect. But I thought I'd start with a little bit of an analogy. Um, recently became aware that some of my cultural references are dating me a little bit too much. But uh, does this evoke any images for anybody? First one to shout out something will... What's that? Build it and they'll come. Yeah, that's, uh, except build it and they won't come is typically how it works. Uh, but I view this, this is a principal investigator with a dream. <clears throat> and this is the co-PI team that are there to support that dream. And if we put that in the context of convergence research, by NSF definition, we define that as research driven by a specific and compelling problem and deep integration across disciplines. And this can be accomplished with a good PI and a good co-PI team. But I'd like to add to that today and add the notion of translation because it's really important that particularly convergence research gets translated out to the world uh, for greater use. So I would say two symbols of success in that are when people that you don't pay on the award want to participate so much that they do without funding. And I would say, of course, when those results become translated for widespread public use. So going back to the movie, I would say maybe convergence research is when this line of cars is coming toward that baseball field in the evening that the, that the fictitious game takes place in Field of Dreams. And of course, massive dissemination to the public is what we see today. Had to get a San Diego reference in there, so this is my one San Diego reference, uh, where we have tens of thousands of people attend these games. The title of the talk being Untapped Potential this broader participation is that zone for untapped potential that I wanted to mention today. And we couldn't mention that without talking about a platform. So the baseball field in that movie was really the platform that allowed all of this to occur. So I want to add platform in the middle of those two areas of that diagram that I showed. Now we'll go off and talk about the, the platforms itself or what we call science gateways. It's an NSF term of art to call these things science gateways. <clears throat> So initially, Science Gateways had a pretty humble beginning. There were people who didn't know how to use large computers that could have benefit, benefited from using them. And a gateway was all about puncturing that fence and putting a web interfa interface in front of these difficult to use resources so that people could do it without having a computer science degree. But what they've really evolved into is platforms for sharing during the contact, conduct of the scientific endeavor. So yes, that initial sharing might have been sharing codes with supercomputers, 
but it very quickly grew into sharing the results of those codes with massive audiences of other researchers and educators who had nothing to do with its creation, but could benefit from it, that notion of translation again. That also grew into supporting large instruments, expensive instruments that not everybody could afford, but for whom the data could be a great benefit as they did the research. Uh, some examples of this, <clears throat> there's a large scale science gateway called Cosmic Squared that processes images coming off of cryo-electron microscopes at scale when, when, they, uh, when they use these devices. Um, NanoHub, which I'm a co-PI of, full disclosure, is like a gigantic app store that serves students and researchers um, at a large scale, and we'll get more into that here in just a little bit. Moving on from expensive instruments, of course, that introduced the notion of heavily data-centric computing. So now gateways had the challenge of becoming good, uh, uh, good access points for large data sets. Some examples of that are one called the Protein Data Bank, which um, hosts over 200,000 measured protein structures and a million or so synthetically generated ones by AI methods, and these are used every day in drug design and medical therapy. It's not always the physical sciences that are supported by science gateways. <clears throat> There's a gateway called slavevoyages.org. And if you go to this site, you will see an incredible collection of data about the slave trade. And you'll also see some really heart-wrenching animations. And I would encourage anybody with any interest in this at all to go to that site and look at some of those animations. Um, moving on from data, these actually became platforms to connect us to each other. They're collaboration platforms now in addition to just uh, lowering the barriers to use complex resources. Some examples of that, uh, there's a site called Coastal Emergency Risks Assessment that um, predicts storm surge levels and researchers use it to develop models, but practitioners use this when storms occur to figure out where to deploy resources. So it's linking together researchers with practitioners. There's another gateway called Planting Science and this links together thousands of high school students with thousands of professional mentors over the years as those students conduct plant biology projects in their coursework in high school. Science gateways link scientists to policymakers, especially during COVID, we saw several science gateways pop up that made it easier for um, policymakers to understand the impact of the decisions they were about to make. So these are, these are some of the examples of what they are, and they matter, scholarly they matter. If I point to one gateway called Cyprus, which is used to compute phylogenetic trees, this is documented to support today actually over 10,000 publications. That's science impact. They have a collaboration impact. The NanoHub gateway that I mentioned, um, we routinely look at resources that cite the NanoHub, and you can see these um, co-authorship networks forming, some very large, some not quite as large, indicating the formation of scientific collaborations. They matter financially. The Protein Data Bank that I talked about undertook a study and estimated that it would take $16 billion to reproduce the data that are in that system now, which is many times over a return on the federal investment. And they can be large. This is a map of the usage of um, the NanoHub gateway, and you can see people day and night are using this, doing all different kinds of things. Now you can imagine, as they do that, it's creating a cacophony of data about what those people are doing on those sites. And if we looked at it raw, it, it looks like a big mess. But if we try to listen to it in an appropriate way, we can actually derive some benefit from it. So let's talk about one untapped opportunity, observing behavior. Now when I go to a gateway, one of the things I would do is I would simulate. I would take a whole bunch of inputs, data, uh, parameters, and so forth, put them into this model, crunch it through the computer, and look at the results. And I would get an answer. And I might do that once, but more likely I'm gonna do that many times over and so are many other people going to do similar things many times over. So one kind of behavior we can observe in here are, are what are the patterns that people use to do the research. 
Consider the very first simulation being done by a user as they execute a sequence of these as that white dot. Now consider they do a second simulation. They move from one place in conceptual space to another place in conceptual space. The distance here is a relative measure of how, how far they've traveled conceptually. The size of the ball indicates how many changes they made in the parameters of a simulation. Here it, it indicates three, these are real data. And then they might move on and do a second simulation where they change one parameter. And then they might move on and do another one where they change two parameters. And they might move on and on and on to see, try that one more time, there we go, to, uh, to see a, a pattern emerge. Now, out of this um, mess of activity, you can actually distill some behavioral patterns. I'm not gonna talk about what those are right now, uh, but we have done some work in that, and it's quite interesting. Now, let's contrast that to another Another individual, the first simulation is again that white dot. The next simulation represents a, a big move, uh, changing a number of parameters. But then they make a small change for one, maybe change one parameter, make another big move, but now watch what happens. Around that one point, they do a very localized exploration. They're clearly looking for something using some methodology to do that. And if we follow this going forward, what we're going to see are many, many major moves accompanied by many small moves as people investigate that highly dimensional space. And what I'm showing you here is a compression of that dimensional space into two dimensions, just to give you a flavor of what that, what that looks like. So that's, that's looking at people as individuals. Now what if we look at ensembles of people that do their work on these platforms or these science gateways? Let's array people in one direction and activity over time in another direction. And watch how that activity evolves. And what we see are lots of people doing very similar things in a similar cadence over time. Anybody not from Purdue willing to hazard a guess of what kind of people those might be? No? You encounter them every day. It's students doing homework, right? And so what we've done here is we've detected that there's translation going on between a development of software simulators and students using them in the classroom. And how did that occur? Uh, in some cases, that occurred within a week. So it's probably a tool developed at the same institution. In other cases, it took more than four years for that translation to occur. And between, there's a whole host of different uh, time, time behaviors there. Roughly speaking, the median of that is about nine months, which is a much faster translation than you're going to see by traditional publication methods. So I'd call that translation. So one of the untapped opportunities for people using, uh, studying data about people using platforms is documenting translation. Let's talk about another hot topic, fair data. Who really enjoys the act of finishing your experiment and then going, act, going back and spending at least the same amount of time documenting all the metadata and everything it requires to make it fair? Right? We all like to do that. It's much funner than the research itself. Well, we don't always have to do that. Um, on the NanoHub, there's a new development called SimTools. It's spelled a little odd, but uh, basically the idea is fair data automatically. When I'm running these simulations, I put in data, I look at the results, and I, I recycle and continue to do different simulations. But if, if equipped with sim tools, a simulation tool will also be depositing its data in a database of recorded results. It's then accessible via an API without you having to do anything extra other than using the sim tool framework. So how this manifests is if you were to go to nanohub.org slash results, you're going to see a list of simulation tools that are recording their data this way. If I look at one of those simulation tools, um, you'll also notice one of the things that happens here is that that, <clears throat> that data set associated with that tool is automatically issued a DOI, so it's referenceable right away. If I click on the tool itself, what'll happen next is I'll be brought to that tool page and looking at that a little more closely, what you'll see is it, it shows different versions of the simulation tool. 
It shows metadata about how the inputs are expected to be and what they represent. And it shows metadata about what kind of outputs those tools provide. Looks a lot like discoverability, fairly easily uh, described. Clicking on a set of records, what would happen next is I would be brought to a list of all of those simulations within that record set. And each one would show me inputs and outputs. Uh, outputs many times are not simple numbers, they're objects of one kind or another. If I click on one of those objects, I'm going to get all of the data behind um, that plot or that set of plots. And another thing you'll notice about this is, there we go, that there's a tab on almost every one of these pages called API. And when I look at that API, it's gonna show me the code necessary to retrieve those results. So all of these results are machine searchable, machine readable, machine accessible, and people can use that same API to develop much more interesting visualizations than the, one that I, the ones I've been showing. Uh, this is one example where every plot in this matrix represents a different simulation, and you're controlling what you look at by um, selecting parameters on, on this one panel on the far left-hand side and seeing the impact on those plots uh, on the right-hand side. And you can imagine many different ways to do these kind of visualization tools, having access to that fair data uh, through the API. So again, untapped opportunity here for platforms and science gateways, fair data generated automatically. Now I've gotten almost halfway through the talk without using the word AI, but let's go ahead and use it. I promise I won't use chat GPT. Um, one of the things that might have struck you when I showed you this clustering activity that we used to detect these students, well, that, that was actually AI. It was AI after it had been cool uh, back in 2012 or so, but before it became cool again. So we didn't really call it AI at the time, we called it clustering. But there are many other opportunities for AI in science gateways and platforms, particularly when they reach that very large set of users. Um, Reed talked a little bit about some of this yesterday, but I'm gonna refresh people on this notion of surrogate models. Um, most of the time, the kinds of things that we wanna solve are equations that we, of course, can't solve analytically. And so what we do in computing is we take that set of equations, we throw a big grid on top of it, and we solve for every point on that grid. And in order to do that, we throw a big computer at it or throw it at a big computer to do that. And maybe a month, maybe a week, maybe a few hours later, we get a nice big solution. Um, and that's, that's neat. As an individual, that's an interesting thing to do. But now think about all of these people accessing these simulation tools from a common platform, right? Then something different happens. Behind the scenes, we have a lot of solutions and a lot of problems that were used to generate those solutions. And we know that these are all of interest to human beings because they were the ones who did this. Now, it's not too big of a stretch of the imagination to think that we can equip that science gateway with basically a software robot that looks in between all of those areas that were of human interest, runs a bunch more of these big simulations, and then what happens? Well, suddenly we have what looks like a training set, sufficient data to generate one of these surrogate models. You can envision a day where science gateways will actually become automatic surrogate model generators. So, what does that do? So what? It, it shatters the notion of large computing, it generates warp speed type results by comparison uh, and fairly accurate. And we could do many different things with that. So you might, you might ask, well, so what? Traditionally, uh, in the early days, it was pretty easy to have data where the large computers existed. As we've gotten much more intense on the size of data sets that we use, it's become much more difficult to have the data where the computers are, and you're not gonna load a computer on a truck to get it where the data is, and many times the data can't be moved easily uh, to where the computers are. But when these big computers can generate these surrogate models, in a way, we've solved one of the holy grails of high-performance computing. We can move compute to the data simply by moving a surrogate model to where the data are. 
Why might that be important? Well, instead of being privileged to be able to access one of a few very um, prestigious compute centers in the, in the country, and there's probably more here, sorry it's not representing everybody, we can take these surrogate models and distribute them in a much wider network of computing resources that aren't as big and don't require as much resource and generate data in those localities every day. So now we can ask questions relevant to what's going on in those different locations without having to go to these large compute resources. So I believe another untapped opportunity are AI models moving computing to data. And I, I hope we see much more of that in the future. Um, I want to continue a little bit more on AI models and other opportunities they present. So with big computing, we ask big questions. They go away for big amounts of time, and they come back and give us an answer. Sometimes we forgot what the question was by the time we get the answer. And so it's really hard to reframe what our next question is. Getting rid of that notion of big computers and replacing it with an AI model uh, changes this. Certainly what it does is it allows us to ask <clears throat> many more questions and get many more answers quickly, right? Speed, that's nice, that's, that's important, but what it really does is it fundamentally changes how we interact with models and data. It changes it from an interrogation to a conversation. When we can get, ask questions and get answers fast, we remember the question we asked, we know how to reformulate the next question, and that, to me, looks like a conversation, and conversations are really how humans develop an understanding. So I believe that another untapped opportunity is changing our interactions with data and models for these, for these AI models, and it can change the way we think. Um, Yet another opportunity for AI is to intervene in science. Back in a different time, science was done on chalkboards and notebooks and published in papers, and, and that was what was needed to, to do good science. Things have changed. We throw these big computers on top of it. We throw large networks of people on top of that scientific process, and we throw huge amounts of infrastructure that generate and collect all kinds of data about the way people have conducted science. If only we knew what to do with that stuff. Somebody must know, right? Well, kind of turns out everybody in the world knows what to do with that except us in the scientific community. All of these sites on a daily basis are using information that you contribute unknowingly as you navigate through them and go through their processes to mostly help you in the things that you want to do. Not always, but mostly they help you. We don't do that, but there's a huge opportunity for consumer-based analytics to be applied to traces of scientific investigation to help intervene in the process, make the process more effective for us, and make us think in different ways than we do today. This, I think, is something that's in a bare infancy now, but I think if you look forward for a number of years, uh, it should come to pass. And I could go on and talk about a bunch more things. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to start to sort of get to the wrap-up point and give you a few what I think are selling points of Science Gateways. So Science Gateways platforms are engines of broader impact. They make the resources of the few available to the many and they do it very effectively. You can find all kinds of examples of this out there. They are habitats for sustainability. They are places where many researchers who may not be highly resourced on their own can come together and actually fight the sustainability uh, battle as a group in common platforms to try to keep the results alive. They're also a great place to record, especially for computational science, the scientific process. And what's another thing we can do with a recorded process? We can automatically start to determine provenance and reproducibility if we implement, if we uh, instrument these infrastructures correctly. And as I mentioned, I think we can actually use AI to assist further in scientific discovery. So hopefully I've convinced you that you want one of these things. Hopefully you're sitting there thinking,
that's not an easy task to build one of them. Um, and it's not. But fortunately, if you want to build one, you're not alone. We at uh, the Science Gateway Community Institute have discovered about 600 active gateways, which means there's more out there than that. You're also not alone in terms of having lots of different infrastructures to use to build these science gateways. Um, and these, these have had tens of million dollars invested in them over the past 20 years. There's no reason not to look at these things. But unfortunately, you're not alone. It's very hard to figure out what does what. And so sometimes our natural reaction is to say, that's too confusing. It's just a website. How hard can it be to build one of these things? Um, a year later, we figure out it was actually pretty hard and have to start, usually have to start over. So the National Science Foundation did form both a software institute and a center of excellence focused on science gateways to try to bridge these gaps of, of knowledge and bring it to the community. You can think of these two things as one of them being a community building organization, the center of excellence. The other is a full service consulting organization that should people be interested in science gateways, we can uh, design, build, and operate science gateways on their behalf so that they don't have to deal with that, the IT hassles of doing that. We've been doing it now for a period of um, about seven years. We've had over 160 consulting engagements. We've touched a lot of students and, and different attendees, and we've actually measured the financial impact of, of the consulting work we've done. And it's been documented to speed up efforts at about seven times, uh, seven times what would have happened if the people had tried to do it on their own. It's actually a positive ROI for a research project. Um, NSF review panels don't always like to hear that kind of stuff, but it's, it's nice that it sometimes can be true. So if this is interesting to you, uh, our Center of Excellence is having a few events coming up. We have a, a Gateways Conference in Pittsburgh right at the end of this month. For those of you interested in sustainability, not, not green sustainability, but financial sustainability of your projects, we have a, an activity called Focus Week coming up at TAC in April. Everybody here would be invited to attend. All you've got to do is go apply at sciencegateways.org. And one last thing we're doing as a center of excellence is we are conducting a series of future-looking workshops to try to define the next five to 10 years of technology innovation needed in science gateways to support specific domain sciences. The current one that's running is focused on artificial intelligence. Uh, if anybody in this room is interested in participating in that in one way or another, feel free to send a note to help at sciencegateways.org. And we'd love to hear you and uh, have you participate. 